One of the things that troubles me about the discussion, and I, I really like the move to human-animal comparison, um, is that we're at the top end of the story, what's good, what's right, and so on. Um, we have pretty clear ideas of what you know, George Bush might have called evil. Um, uh, certainly when someone uh, tortures another uh, for some personal value, some personal good, um, uh, we recognize there's something fundamentally wrong with that. When uh, I have many colleagues that have studied primates, particularly chimpanzees, and um, have now seen a number of films, uh, videos taken where chimpanzees have torn other chimpanzees limb from limb while they're alive uh, in, in just killing them uh, in this process. Uh, and they do this, of course, when they kill monkeys for food. Um, uh, it's a horrific thing to watch uh, because I'm inside that monkey's head that's getting torn apart. Um, I get the suffering. I can, in a sense, though I don't suffer myself, I can anticipate what that suffering is. And I think the suffering piece is right. Um, we as human beings, uh, looking at this, I don't think that this chimpanzee is morally corrupt because he's done this. But if I saw a human being doing that, especially in adults, uh, young children maybe not, but especially adults, I would find something terribly repulsive about this. And what it is is that I recognize that that adult can get inside the head of somebody else, uh, can, in a sense, intersubjectively get a sense of what's going on, anticipate it. And when someone tortures someone else, it's because they can do that, because they can reason. So I like to think about it, you know, that one of the greatest gifts we have is to be able to get inside of each other's head. It's sort of using this greatest gift we've been given that other species don't have uh, against other species. It's a remarkably horrific thing to watch and to think about. And one of the things that I think at the bottom end of things, rather than talk about the good and the stuff, I think we can be pretty clear about what's at the bottom end. What we say, no, uh-uh. And if we have some pretty clear understandings of that, I think it's a good hint to move our way up. Why it is that we don't hold uh, four-year-olds responsible for murder, even if they've killed somebody. Uh, why we don't hold people who are uh, mentally ill, schizophrenic, and thinking that somebody else is a demon. Uh, why you don't hold them responsible. And I think it has to do with a reasoning issue. Terry, are, are you sure that you're not, when you see somebody being torn limb from limb, how much is it that you are empathetic with them, and how much is it you're worried that you're going to be the next one that gets torn limb from limb if that kind of behavior is allowed to persist? Well, I admire you if it's the former. Well, so it, what I'm saying is, I will tell you. I'm not talking about experience. people. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about watching an animal get torn no, limb from then limb. No, you said it, what it would, how you would feel to no, see a human being. No, get torn it's limb yes, from. it's it's imagining myself in that oh, moment. Okay, got it. Got okay. It, good. Well, That's I, why we have I policy. think you may have the suggested <clears throat> reason for uh, what Rebecca and I agree on is uh, the amazing, and Richard, the amazing moral <laughs> improvement uh, that we've seen, and that is uh, it comes from empathy, it comes from uh, recognizing that other people are like oneself. And where does that come from? Well, I think it may, why has it gotten better? It may be simply because people are more literate and... Uh, yeah. Uh, we go. We go to the movies and we see people living lives. I think uh, the Im the image of uh, of Sidney Poitier behaving in a way that we would recognize we might behave in movies, for example, had a tremendous effect in improving race relations in this country. Just simply, we were exposed to other people in literature, in newspapers, in movies. And, uh, and so we improve in our, in our treatment of them. I, I, I wanted to go back to what Pritzker said about haziness. I agree. I think that moral judgments are irreducibly hazy, and I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see any reason for um, saying I'm not, I distrust morality. I, th I think aesthetic judgments are also irreducibly hazy. Uh, so what? I think uh, not everything is mathematics, and we have to live with a morality which cannot be reduced to uh, rational judgment. Uh, I, I still insist, I, I'm delighted to find an issue on which I seem to disagree with other people here, because I was afraid that what I was saying would be so completely obvious to everyone it would be a waste of time. But I, 
I continue to uh, take the example of vengeance, which someone mentioned in passing. Um, should we, in addition to deterrence or just putting people away so that they can't continue their crimes, should we also exert vengeance on people who do evil things? I think so. Um, I, so, so do I. Yeah, I don't, and yeah. I. But it's, I don't call it vengeance, I call it punishment. Well, punishment. Well, I find vengeance are different. Well, it's vengeance is more personal. I'm not. Uh, I yeah. All right. I don't. I, I don't want to argue. Yes, that. they should punish. Yeah, I think I think people who do evil things should be punished, and I'm happy if they are. And it has nothing to do with the parents or reforming them or anything else. I think Hitler. You know, unfortunately, he put himself outside the reach of punishment. But I think Hitler should be punished because he's evil. Uh, this comes back to the question about free will and so on. Uh, the fact that we, I mean, if we lived in a deterministic universe, or in a universe where determinism is qualified by the randomness in quantum mechanics, uh, I would still say Hitler should be punished because he's evil. It doesn't matter why he became evil. Uh, you know, maybe because his father beat him. Uh, I don't care. He's evil. Was well, his, was, was his evil hurt. haziness? Was there, was there a haziness to his evilness from your perspective? No, but I think there is a haziness in balancing this kind of judgment with other judgments. There may be, for example, prudential arguments for not going out and punishing people who do evil things, depending on how evil it is. And I, there's, it's, there's an irreducible haziness in trading off um, one value against another value. We have no way, I claim, of calculating, for example, how much of society's resources should go into punishing evil people. But you do have a pretty clear line from what you just said about who's evil and who's not, or what is evil and what's not. Well, even there, there uh, might be, uh, no, I'm not. But, but Hitler has clearly crossed that line. Yeah, you. I mean, everyone uses Hitler Stalin, because he's Stalin so far. Stalin crossed that line for you, perhaps. Yeah. Um, let's be careful not to treat ourselves as models of people generally, right? Because, because you guess, we, we, sit at, we self consciously reflect on this. I mean, I can give a simple example but with respect to this moral progress stuff. So, when I was a kid, when I was a child, my parents thought that gay people were worse than criminals, right? They basically thought gay people should not, it was just an instinctive judgment that they did not think gay people should be able to participate in society at all. Um, well, now my parents are still alive and they have gay friends. They, they, they have conventional liberal morality about gay people. And this process, this process happened very, very slowly. I don't think they ever really thought about it much at all. Right? There is, we're all in a state all the time of kind of indoctrinating each other and coordinating, and that the targets, are, the, the circumstances under which we do this coordination are themselves socially evolving. So um, there was no magic line, my, you know, there was no day on which my parents had benighted attitudes towards gays and then enlightened attitudes towards gays. They just broadened, <laughs> they, just, they just changed. Um, and that's what we're all, that's what all people are doing all the time. Of course, it's no surprise in light of that that we should see this kind of dramatic moral change over the last couple of hundred years because, of course, the wider economic and political circumstances of people have changed for much, much more faster and much, much more dramatically since the Industrial Revolution than they ever did before. So people in 1700 didn't live all that differently from people in 1300, but people in and in, in 2012 looked very, very differently indeed from people in 1912.